The following program deals with controversial subjects. The theories, opinions, and beliefs expressed are not the only possible interpretation. Viewers are invited to make a judgment based on all available information. If what you are about to see is real, it's the most startling film footage in history. Although we remain skeptical, some experts believe this is authentic footage of an alien life form. Real or not, we must warn you. This appears to be an actual autopsy. And some of the footage you will see in the next hour is very gruesome. Stay with us as we put the question to you. Alien autopsy, fact or fiction? There must have been alien bodies. If the footage is authentic, that pretty well proves it. We've learned that aliens are visiting the Earth. Daddy said they looked like a small 10-year-old child. You could have uh, the proof that, uh, that this actually was an extraterrestrial craft. I'm not seeing a liver over to the right. I'm seeing a mass that I cannot readily explain. And uh, I have great difficulty in correlating this with any human body that I have seen. This really felt like a, a real body that was being cut open. It's the story of the millennium. If it's a true document, it is a document of exceptional importance. If it's a fake, it should be hailed as one of the most extraordinary fakes ever put together by a filmmaker. This is the Army Airfield in Roswell, New Mexico. During World War II, this was the base of the elite 509th bomb group. The Enola Gay that dropped the atomic bomb on Japan originated from here. The men and women who lived and worked here were used to keeping secrets. But in the summer of 1947, something definitely crashed just outside of town. And 48 years later, it remains a mystery. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. Army officers say the missile, found sometime last week, has been inspected at Roswell, New Mexico, and sent to Wright Field, Ohio, for further inspection. I was called to headquarters, was given copies of a press release which stated in essence that we had in our possession a flying disc. I was told to hand deliver to the uh, four news media we had in town at that time. We had two radio stations and two newspapers. Walter Hout was the public relations officer for the 509th bomb group. His press release quickly made the rounds to the radio networks and evening papers around the country, feeding the curiosity of a nation where hundreds of flying disc sightings had been reported in recent months. But it was over almost as soon as it began. Within four hours, General Ramey, commander of the 8th Air Force, had taken charge, issuing a new statement. It wasn't a flying disc at all. Everybody believed it, that it was a weather balloon. The way it was handled, it was a real slick way of say, yes, we've got a flying saucer, and then have a general who is much more knowledgeable, naturally, say, no, that was a new type of weather balloon. But the residents of Roswell knew it was something more than a weather balloon. My father was on the intelligence team at the Roswell Army Airfield, and it was his job to look at what they thought was a crashed aircraft or crashed something out there out of Roswell. When he came in, he was very excited. He woke my mother and myself up. It must have been 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning and he wanted us to see what he was bringing in from the field. He said, this is parts of a flying saucer. And uh, it was all brought in and spread out on the kitchen floor. And uh, we just looked at it. You know, I, I picked up this particular I-beam and held it up to my upper left to look at it with the kitchen light reflecting on the inner surface. And that's when I saw the, uh, the writing or the symbols of some sort. I thought at first, this is hieroglyphics or some kind of writing like that. It certainly looked alien to me. This film footage purportedly shows the actual crash debris.
carefully cataloged and placed on display. It is shown here for the first time anywhere. The debris in the film was somewhat different than the debris that I saw on the kitchen floor. Certainly the symbols on the so-called I-beam were much larger. The size of the beams are certainly different. Uh, the one I saw was uh, probably greatest three-eighths of an inch uh, in cross-sectional diameter, 12 to 18 inches long. The beam in the film certainly was much larger than this, several inches in cross-sectional diameter. If this is an authentic film, then it could have come from a different portion of the craft. Uh, actually, the material that I saw almost resembled something that could have been blown out through, a, through the side of the craft, like there's an in-flight explosion just spreading debris or blowing debris out of the side of the craft. Even more intriguing than the eye beams with the cryptic symbols is the metal fixture, obviously designed for some being with six fingers on each hand. You wonder if that might not have been some sort of control mechanism that they put their hands in the uh, grooves that are made for that. And maybe there's some way they can control the craft just by thought transference, by, by thinking about something with the hands in contact with this plate, that maybe it's some very unusual, very weird control mechanism. While researching a book on the incident, author Kevin Randall discovered that more people had handled the crash debris than anyone had ever suspected. I think at last count, I had spoken to around four dozen people who, who handled various aspects of the debris. The most dramatic is the foil-like material that you could wad up into a ball and let it go and it would unfold itself. They tried to burn it and they couldn't burn it. It wouldn't catch on fire and they took out their pocket knives and they tried to cut it and they couldn't cut it. Frankie Rowe had watched as her father, the Roswell fire captain, and his crew played with a piece of the strange metal. I guess they all had their chance to play with it for a while and it was laying on the table, so I reached over and picked it up. And I played for it probably about five minutes. When you would wad it up in your hand, you couldn't feel it in your hand. You couldn't feel you had anything there. And it would go to a size that was so small that you'd have to look to see if it was still in your hand. And then when you drop it, it spread out all over the table. I sincerely believe we had the crash of something from outer space, because we still don't have materials that compare with the descriptions I've gotten of the material that was picked up out on the ranch and brought into town. If there was any doubt that a flying saucer had crashed, Frankie Rowe's father, one of the first at the crash site, had seen the most convincing proof of all, living proof. Daddy came in so excited, and he said, what they saw was not from this world. There were two bodies that were laying on the ground outside of this craft, and that there was one, what he called, little person. And he said, there's one little person that was walking around. And he said, they were still alive. And he said that the other two were dead and that this one that was alive was very sad. My dad would not have gotten excited over a weather balloon. He was not easily excitable. And this is the most thrilled I'd ever seen him in my life. He thought that was the most fantastic thing in the world. Through his numerous interviews with those connected to the Roswell incident, Kevin Randall has been able to put together a sequence of events from the time the spacecraft and bodies were recovered. The best evidence we have from a number of eyewitness sources is that the craft and the bodies were brought to Hangar 84 on the Roswell Army Airfield and stored overnight before transport. What we understand from the eyewitness testimony is the bodies were sealed in a large wooden crate uh, kept at the center of the hangar. It's absolutely brilliant what they did. They, they announced they have a flying saucer, but they've already captured it. They've already got it. There's nothing to see, so nobody goes out looking for the thing. Then they shift everything to Fort Worth. The higher headquarters says, no, no, those guys made a mistake. It was just a weather balloon. The press can't find Jesse Marcel because he's in Fort Worth and he's been silenced. You know, when he came back from Carswell, after flying the debris, he did tell me not to talk about this, told my mother not to talk about this. This is a non-event. Play like it never happened. Don't even talk about this with your friends, which I didn't. And uh, he, years later, he confided that he was actually part of the cover-up because he uh, 
went along with the Air Force explanation, even though he knew full well that that was not true. There's corroborative testimony that suggests somebody was putting pressure on people to silence them, and they used what means were necessary to keep those people silent. With the military people, it was merely the threat of, of imprisonment and going to jail because they understood that. With some of the civilians, it was, they were told that if you ever talk about it, you will be killed. In the case of Frankie Rowe, a military officer came to ask her about the strange piece of metal that she had handled. I said, yes, I did handle it. And he started emphasizing, no, you didn't. Well, my mother was pretty strict, and we didn't lie. So I'm insistent that, yes, I saw it, yes, I held it. And he got mad, and he got louder. And he had one of those, looks like a small baseball bat that hooks on the side of your belt. And he took that out, and he's holding it, and he's starts beating his hand. Every time he said something, he would hit that on his hand. And he would say, I want you to understand, you were never there. You did not see anything. You did not hear a conversation. And he said, if you can't understand this, there are things that we can do. He said, we can take you out here in the middle of this desert. He said, this is a big desert here. He said, no one will ever find your bodies, ever. No one will ever know what happened to you. He said, the only way I'm going to let you stay around or live is if you promise you'll never talk about this the rest of your life. So I told him I wouldn't. The people of Roswell kept quiet about what they saw. Supposedly, under tight security, everything from the crash was loaded onto planes. Many believe the debris was flown to Wright Airfield in Dayton, Ohio. The bodies were thought to have been flown somewhere else. The government wanted the story to die, and for decades, the cover-up was successful. But what may be the most convincing evidence somehow escaped detection. Here in the desert just outside Roswell is where the alleged crash happened some 50 years ago. Was it a flying saucer? Were there alien bodies on board? Or was it just a weather balloon, as the Air Force claimed? People still come and look for some kind of clue. But the evidence of the alien crash didn't come from here. It was revealed halfway around the world. An alien autopsy is always going to be the subject of ridicule. Who's going to believe that an alien autopsy is an alien autopsy? It's just a ridiculous subject. Ray Santilli owns a small music and video distribution company in London. He was acquiring some 1950s rock and roll footage when an elderly American cameraman he had been dealing with said, by the way, I have something else to show you. And, you know, we looked at it, and it was just the most incredible piece of film. And uh, obviously, my first impression is, this can't be real. What Santilli saw and eventually purchased were reels of black and white film showing an autopsy being performed on a strange humanoid being. The cameraman, who claims to have had a top military clearance, told Santilli that in 1947 he was flown urgently to Roswell, where he filmed the recovery of several of these beings, both alive and dead, as well as the autopsy of one of them. He set aside certain canisters of film which he felt there were, were problems in processing, and they, they needed special treatment during processing. The rest he sent straight back to Washington. And um, when he eventually processed the, uh, the remaining canisters, uh, he tried uh, and went to great lengths to try and get Washington to come and pick the reels of film up, but they didn't. He kept it in a cardboard box, simple as that, and he kept it in his archive. The question of, well, is it a hoax, then goes back to the incident itself. But what he saw was a disc, a flying disc that had crashed. It was on his back. He saw all these creatures that he calls freaks laying outside of the vehicle, screaming in pain for most of it. But he can't tell you where they came from. He doesn't know. While I was in his house, and as you would expect it, it, with anyone of that age, he's got a great deal of memorabilia. You know, there's photographs on the wall, there's his photo albums, there's his diary. I mean, you, you can see his enrollment papers, his discharge papers. And he seemed a genuine enough person. So why is Santelli unwilling to reveal the cameraman's identity? Our agreement with the cameraman was to protect his privacy, which is how we acquired the footage in the first place. If he can get some kind of assurance that he's not going to be hounded uh, by, by people, he may want to 
uh, come out, I don't know, he's maybe watching this program right now and thinking, what am I going to do? Um, his concern is, firstly, he's, he's in his 80s, he just wants a peaceful life. That's the first thing. Secondly, he's accepted money, which is cash, and what effect is that going to have in terms of his tax position as well? I think the pressure will increase upon him. I think he'll realise that if he is telling the truth, and I have no reason to doubt that, if this was, you know, a crash of a, a space vehicle from wherever, that it is the mo most momentous event in, in hu human history, and he owes it to mankind to tell his story. I'm going to bet you, and I've been doing this business for 30 years, that this man probably lives somewhere in Florida. In order to verify the existence of this cameraman, we turn to world-renowned investigator, William C. Deere. When you all brought me this case to take a look at, I, I have to tell you, it was quite skeptical. Is there a cameraman? Does he really exist? Did he exist? And can I find him? The answer really lies with the cameraman. That's where the answer lies in trying to authenticate this film one way or the other. We've satisfied ourselves uh, that the footage is genuine. You know, it's not, it's not a question of the Hitler diaries or, 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 or a situation like that. All we're doing is we're placing it into the public domain and saying, look, here it is, please investigate us. This film we're about to show you is either the first documentary evidence that an alien being visited our planet, or it's one of the most ambitious and fantastic frauds ever put on film. The alleged cameraman claims he shot the footage at Fort Worth Army Air Base. In a letter, he explains to us that one of the aliens discovered near Roswell had been secretly flown there for further study. This could be the world's first look at an actual being from another planet. You are watching the, watching the autopsy of what some say is an alien from outer space. Though silent, the 17-minute film is as dramatic as any science fiction thriller to come out of Hollywood. But this may not be a filmmaker's fantasy. This could very well be real. The strange body appears intact, except for an ugly wound on the right thigh. Two mysterious doctors wearing contamination suits study its bizarre features. A third person wearing a mask watches from behind the glass partition. Is this indeed a top secret military autopsy performed on an alien in 1947? Like with any mystery, we need to hear from witnesses, examine the hard evidence, and bring in the experts. First, the eyewitnesses. Daddy said they looked like a small 10-year-old child. The head was too large for the body, and the skin color was a pink with a kind of a gray cast to it. Of course, you can't tell skin color in this, but the size, the shape of the eyes, that would all pretty well fit. The nurse that was supposedly there described uh, an individual that may have looked somewhat like the uh, individual that was being autopsied. The large head, the black eyes. I think she described four fingers rather than six. So there's a, a discrepancy or a difference there. According to Frankie Rowe, her father discovered three beings still alive at the crash site. He kept saying, there's no need for us to be afraid. They're not here to hurt us. And he said that he really felt badly that we couldn't help them. The cameraman writes that he photographed three strange beings. Each was crying, clutching a box close to his chest. They cried louder as we approached, he writes. One of the officers managed to pry loose the box by hitting the being with the butt of his rifle. I feel very sorry for whoever that was. If it was from some other world, planet, their family will never know what happened to them. They'll never go back home. Of course, this could all be a story that the cameraman made up. An eyewitness testimony is sometimes unreliable, especially when it's almost 50 years old. What clues can we examine to determine whether what we're seeing is a true historical document or a clever fabrication? We've looked closely at some of the objects in the room. Our purpose? To determine whether they even existed in 1947. The wall clock. A General Electric model is indeed from the 1940s. And that black phone with the heavy receiver and the curly cord is a Bell Standard model from 1937. Though they could all be purchased later, their presence in the room is nonetheless consistent with the time period. That brings us to the film itself. Can it be dated? We took the film to Larry Kate, who spent 16 years in the manufacturing division of Kodak. 
East McCodic Company, in trying to distinguish the age of the film, keeps track of the date of manufacture. And this is done through geometric codes. And the symbols on the edge code were a square and a triangle, which were used in Rochester, New York, by Eastman Kodak Company to denote the following years of manufacture, 1927 or 1947 or 1967. So the film stock itself could be from 1947. What about the way it was shot? What can the very look of the film reveal about its authenticity? It would make much sense to think that, yes, this film could have been shot in the late 40s, early 50s. Paolo Kerke Uze is senior curator of motion pictures at Eastman House in Rochester, New York. I'm often asked how difficult it is to fake a film. The answer is no. You cannot fake a motion picture that easily. It would require an amount of technical know-how, of sophistication, that would make the operation not worthwhile. I have to say I feel that what we've seen here is a hoax. Alan Davio is one of Hollywood's most acclaimed cinematographers. He was the director of photography on E.T., Bugsy, Empire of the Sun, and Congo. Davio is suspicious of the film because of how it regularly goes out of focus as if to hide what may not be real. What we're seeing here is, is a, somebody photographing this intentionally letting the image go out of focus. It just doesn't make sense that he would go in and make no adjustment on the focus. The fact that it lost focus is consistent with uh, the type of equipment that uh, they had to be using. Roderick Ryan knows as much as anyone about what it was like filming for the military in the 1940s. A combat cameraman for the Navy, he photographed the most secret government projects during the 40s and 50s including the atomic bomb tests at Bikini Atoll. The cameras uh, in general use at that time by the military were uh, Filmo cameras made by Bell and Howell. The camera did not have through the lens focusing. So if it maintained focus, uh, there could be the possibility that it was done with modern day equipment, which you can maintain focus. and. Uh, that it was simulated rather than real footage from 1947. Davio was also suspicious of the film's authenticity because of the photographer's apparent inability to get the best shots. There's one case in particular where they're sawing the skull, where the person operating the camera continuously moves to a place repeatedly that he's not gonna see anything, the doctor's back, and, and doesn't make the effort to go around the other side to, to look at the saw coming towards you and perhaps get a better view. He keeps moving, uh, to keep out of the way of the surgeons. Uh, if you look at the, uh, the surgical uh, crew, uh, they're moving also. And uh, he's, he's just uh, trying to be uh, inobtrusive. We've had this out with the camera because if nothing else, his integrity in terms of camera work is the only thing that's actually forced the comment out of him because people have criticized the camera work. The cameraman was dressed in the same outfits as the surgeon, that's a, so he was restricted in his movement. And he said that the handheld camera was standard, you know, standard issue at that time. And they didn't treat it any different because it was either an, you know, an experiment or an alien creature. The role of a photographer in the military is usually to record an event. It is not his job to do pretty pictures. And this, I, I think, was a very adequate job of recording an event. I will say that there's some terrific work done here, but I do not believe that this is a real event that I'm seeing. Every fake I've seen, the impression of fake comes up immediately. Let, let's put ourselves in the position of someone who decides to make a fake. Why in the world someone would invest such an amount of money, of effort, of mise-en-scene to put together a 23-minute film of this kind? It defies reason. It doesn't make sense. Let's say the film is from 1947. Kodak says that's possible. And it looks like an army photographer could have shot it. That doesn't mean this isn't a hoax. But how far would someone have to go to stage it? Camera tricks are one thing. But how do you fake the flesh and blood body of an alien? Especially one that's about to be cut open. Is this really an autopsy of an alien being? Or could it be something else? A dummy? A deformed human? An incredible hoax. To find out, we showed the film to two of the world's leading pathologists. And I have to issue a warning at this point. What you are about to see is extremely graphic. 
Chris Milroy is a senior lecturer in forensic pathology at the University of Sheffield in England. His expertise in determining the cause of death has made him a sought-after witness in murder cases around the world. Cyril Wecht is a past president of the American Academy of Forensic Sciences. He has performed or supervised close to 40,000 autopsies. I have never performed an autopsy on anybody that even closely resembles uh, the being that we see on this film. Well, the ears are low set. They're below the position that one would expect to see in a normal human being. This strange creature that some are saying comes from outer space does fit the popular conception of what an alien looks like. The huge head and enlarged eyes are familiar from books and movies about otherworldly visitors. And it has other bizarre features not common to humans. There are six fingers on each hand, and there are also six toes on each foot, a condition known as polydactyly. And that's seen in various kinds of chromosomal or genetic uh, abnormalities and defects. You don't see any male genitalia and therefore all the indications are it looks like a female body, but without any secondary sexual development. In other words, there are no developed breasts. Weck's initial reaction was that we were looking at a woman with Turner's syndrome, a chromosomal disorder that affects one in 5,000 female births. The victims, who are lacking feminine chromosomes, do not develop sexually. However, few survive into adulthood. 99% of people who have these sexual chromosomal abnormalities abort spontaneously. In other words, they're just not born. So one of the things that I would think of is the possibility of a very, very rare Turner's syndrome baby that managed to survive well into the teens. But Turner's syndrome is not its only defect. There are also the six fingers and toes and the enlarged eyes. Can this extraordinary diversity of disorders ever appear in one human being? I wouldn't be surprised to find something with this pattern of abnormalities. I would think it would be very rare, but I wouldn't be surprised if someone said that this has been described somewhere in the medical literature. Not only is the body being examined a mystery, but so are the examiners hidden behind their contamination suits. As respected teachers, both Wecht and Milroy have trained hundreds of doctors. They know how a real autopsy is conducted versus what would give away an amateur or even an actor. They are either pathologists or they're surgeons who have done a fair number of autopsies. This supposedly was filmed in 1947. And while things haven't changed, we see some things that would have been expected at that time, such as the use of a handsaw in removing the skull cap. I should also like to point out that this kind of a rectangular shaped somewhat sunken tray was the kind that I recall being around many, many years ago. We don't see uh, these things around very much today, if at all. The basic procedures that were being carried out are those that one would do in an autopsy. There are certain questions that I have to ask about the procedures. The, I mean, if, it, if this is purportedly an alien, I question whether you would just spend two hours on it. One would surely spend uh, weeks, months, if not years, dissecting uh, somebody who is, um, you know, a body of an alien. If this is an alien, then it reportedly died when its space vehicle crashed to Earth. Both doctors who spend much of their time testifying in murder cases were suspicious about the cause of death. When you have major high-speed crashes, you get much more extensive injuries than were present on this body. The injuries present are are odd in that there is really only one major injury and that is to the right thigh. This looks almost like the kind of an injury you might get if you had an incendiary kind of a missile, unless for whatever reason there was some kind of treatment going on for a malignancy or something having to do with experimental work on radiation or burns and you have then massive destruction of that area, more or less in a deliberate design fashion. A radiation experiment gone wrong? That would explain why the doctors are protecting themselves with contamination suits. And radiation could be the cause of the being's death and also its freakish deformities. Remember, Roswell, where the body was supposedly found, was near the site of our military's secret nuclear testing program. 
Could this represent some very unfortunate woman who had a malignancy, probably of the ovaries or the cervix, the uterus, uh, who then received radiation treatment? That's a possibility that we should keep in mind. But that would not explain, as far as I'm concerned, obviously the polydactyly. That's not going to make toes and fingers grow. That would not explain the disproportionately large head and would not explain the disproportionately large orbital sockets. If the pathologist cannot yet explain what could have caused this uniquely deformed creature, maybe they'll find the answer to the mystery when the dissection begins. That's when they take their examination to the inside of the body. I cannot relate these structures to abdominal contents. The liver, if it were the liver, should be over here to the right. I'm seeing a mass that I cannot readily explain, and uh, I have great difficulty in correlating this with any human body that I have seen. This is a structure that must be the brain if it is a human being. It looks like no brain that I've ever seen, whether it's a brain filled with tumor, a brain that has been radiated, a brain that has been traumatized and is hemorrhagic. When it was outside of the body, what was, what was shown in the tray did not to me look like a human brain. It just looked too discolored and misshapen. I would have to say, as, as, as difficult as it is for me to say it, as reluctant as I am to say it, that uh, what I have seen here uh, does not appear to be a human being. What, what is this? I would prefer to say for the time being that it is humanoid. I'm not going to say it is from a distant planet. What planet? I don't know. Uh, but I cannot say that it is a member of the human race as you and I know the human race. Of course, another explanation is that this is not the body of a flesh and blood being at all, but rather a man-made creation designed to fool whoever sees it. How hard would it be to make a dummy that bleeds so convincingly? No one is better at tricking the public that monsters can be real than Stan Winston, whose company has created some of the most lifelike creatures to come out of Hollywood. He built the dinosaurs in Jurassic Park, and appropriately enough, the extraterrestrial predators of aliens. For Winston, recreating a simple humanoid like this should be a piece of cake. My initial reaction when I first saw the piece was that it was not real, that it was, gonna, it was a body that someone had created as a prop when we started the autopsy and actually cutting this body open and knowing how difficult it is for us in in the live effects world to actually simulate cutting skin i started looking at it and saying to myself if in fact this isn't real uh, i would be real proud of creating an image like that myself today in fact i want to talk it over with some guys here in the studio as to how we would do that. When was this supposed to be? 1947. The question is whether or not we could do this if it weren't real. And uh, let's take it back to just before the cut. The organic quality of the, the legs and the feet, and all that looks very good. You see how uniform the blood is on the inside surface of the skin and the amount of drippage down the side where it's uniformly wet on the inside. But, I mean, we never are able to do that. All right, let's fast forward to the, to the skull. Yeah, this is pretty incredible as a, if it's a built prop. Point is, is if we did this, I'd be pretty proud of it. Yeah. This is what I find most interesting. Yeah. Very real. Is the peeling of this skin the and how to create this uneven exactly and how it. to create that on a skull is to cast the skull inside the skin. But what about the wetness? And, and what about the unevenness of it? It's not like it's been cored. And what about the bleeding of it, the wetness of it that is not, you don't see tubes spurting, you don't see blood drip, it's just all evenly wet what materials are out there that will duplicate skin like that i mean it's mostly the silicones that we're using now specially formulated That's what I said, silicones exactly. and they didn't I don't have know those who's... in 1947 no did they? and no they didn't and anybody that's got access to them now 
He's been out there doing a lot of uh, big time Hollywood this, monster movie yeah, stuff. Yeah, and I don't, I don't know how they did this. If it's been done today, to look like it was done then, it would be a many, many multiple thousands of dollars. Yeah, Stan, even if it wasn't made to look, period. I mean, just to do this properly yeah. would be really be very expensive. And my hats off to the people who created it or that poor alien that's dead on the <laughs> table. Our search for the cameraman is continuing. Here's what we know so far. We have a white male. We know he's 82 or 83 years old currently. We know when he entered the service. We know that he was in the service for 10 years. With a detailed profile constructed, Bill Deere set his team of investigators in motion. That's going to be a really important thing for us to follow up on because 1955 and the fact they're still in existence is going to give us some credibility as far as morgue files. It gives us something to look at. So let's pay particular attention to that. Joe has the photographic unit for the Army, Air Force. You've got it for the Marine Corps. And Michael, you can take Universal News. Call this morning on the history section of the military base. We, we could try Carswell. Carswell still has a good library. Now we're able to take all of that information. Oh, one thing that's important. We know that he's a human being, and a human being makes mistakes. People like to brag. People like to talk. So that is part of the profile, too. We take all of that and place that into that can, of, unmarked can of food. And now I'm sitting on my desk, this can, with a silver lining. And the only thing that we're lacking now is a picture of our cameraman and his name. Within hours, Deere had a tip that another former military cameraman living in Florida may have some knowledge of the cameraman's identity. He immediately set out for the airport to catch a plane to Florida to meet with the tipster. The man, who was reluctant to be identified on television, agreed to meet Deere in a public place. Like our mystery cameraman, this tipster also had top secret military clearance and was present at many of the same secret events. Well, we we're sitting at a bar and this guy I knew a little bit, not real well, and I'm not gonna say what town it was in, but we got to talking. And he said, well, I was at Roswell where this, they say the aliens crashed, and boom, that was it. He didn't say no more. You know, like he woke up and like, uh-oh, I'm shooting my mouth off. And bear in mind, there's a lot more excitement on something like that probably than preparing for the bomb. Here you got dead aliens down there, and you're shocked. Everybody probably was. If he shot his mouth off, there's people, the government's knowing about it now. They've got to know about it. And maybe he's been warned already. Maybe you won't see him again no more. If he's talked, there's somebody out there that remembers it and somebody is going to come forward with that information. It's going to be a great story if all of a sudden somebody picks up the phone and calls me and says, Mr. Deer, I saw the story. I know who you're talking about, and this is who he is. There are so many open questions. Is the body we've seen really a victim of a fatal accident that happened almost 50 years ago? Did a UFO crash and burn in the New Mexico desert? Could aliens have been curious about our newly developed nuclear technology? What does the government know, and what aren't they telling us? We'll never know until the secrecy surrounding the Roswell incident finally ends. I'm uh, positive that there's information being withheld from the public domain concerning the Roswell event. I'm hoping that they will someday release the information. Tell us what actually happened. The witnesses to this still puzzling event kept their promises and remained silent for decades. Many lived in fear of the very government to which they now turn for answers. Stephen Schiff, congressman from New Mexico, has taken up their cause. His mission, to persuade the military, FBI, and other agencies to finally come clean. When I sent the first request to the, to the Secretary of Defense for a response about the Roswell incident in view of the fact that there were these accusations, essentially of a government cover-up, the response I got was a very terse letter that said in about a sentence or two from the Air Force, uh, we referred your letter to the National Archives, and that's all it said. The National Archives then said, we don't have any information about the Roswell incident. 
which, which I was convinced the Defense Department had to know before they were sending me there. So in other words, I thought I was getting the runaround. To force the Defense Department's hand, Schiff called on the General Accounting Office, which is the investigating arm of Congress. At the end of 1993, the GAO agreed to look into Roswell. But before they could even respond, the Air Force released a report of its own. In late 1994, they offered a new explanation of what crashed in Roswell back in 1947. The Air Force maintained that the crash was still a balloon. They have disavowed the weather balloon story, but they say that it was then a, a different kind of balloon, a special balloon, to go to very high altitude uh, for the purpose of detecting whether the Soviets were exploding nuclear weapons in the atmosphere. Uh, I don't know that the Air Force has ever explained what took them so long to uh, say this is the explanation, if this is the explanation. On July 28, 1995, the GAO issued its report on Roswell. It had requested classified and unclassified records from the Department of Defense, the FBI, the CIA, the Department of Energy, and the White House Office of Science and Technology. With the exception of an FBI teletype and a Roswell Airfield newsletter, both of which referred to the account of a weather balloon, none of these agencies claimed to have any information on Roswell. Schiff had asked the GAO to track down all outgoing messages from the Roswell Army Airfield to military higher-ups in the summer of 1947. The GAO's findings? All these outgoing messages have been destroyed. They believe that the records, in fact, were destroyed more than four decades ago. So there's not an individual on the job now we can just call up and say, what happened to these records? And so the GAO has simply no further recommendations or ideas on how to go farther. The only records we're talking about being destroyed are communications from Roswell Army Airfield, 509th, only atomic bombing group in the world, out, out moving messages. How about the analysis of the materials? How about the autopsy reports? How about the eyewitness testimony from those who stood guard, those who carried it, those who tested at various government labs? There ought to be a ton of other paper. Stanton Friedman and other researchers believe that the complete file in Roswell still remains hidden. It's a file they believe that includes documentary evidence of a crash of a flying saucer and the autopsy of the alien found within. There is no question that film exists of the autopsy. When you have an event like this, you're going to film every aspect of it. We've been told by people who participated in the cleanup on the, both the debris field and the impact site that photographs were taken. Film was taken. All this exists somewhere. Is this film part of that evidence, or is it simply a hoax not even connected to Roswell, but that some are hoping is real in their eagerness to find answers to this 50-year-old mystery? I see nothing in this picture which leads me to believe we're dealing with aliens as opposed to Earthlings with peculiar characteristics. The wreckage doesn't look like anything I've seen from descriptions of wreckage by witnesses I trust. Uh, I can find nothing to link it. It doesn't seem to me that somebody has put together a gigantic spoof here. If they have, boy, they're wasting their time in, in engaging in some small ripoff like this. They should be in Hollywood making some fantastic films with Steven Spielberg or something. Nothing about this thing feels phony. If you came to me and said that you created this illusion, you'd be working here like that. My guess is that this was done by somebody strictly for money. I think eventually it will be shown to be a hoax, but by that time, uh, Santilli will have collected his royalties from the different television companies throughout the world, and he will have made uh, the majority of his sales of videos. If it's a true document, it is a document of exceptional importance. If it's a fake, it should be hailed as one of the most extraordinary fakes ever put together by a filmmaker. Was this a real encounter with another civilization? A bizarre human experiment gone wrong? Or an elaborately staged production? We don't claim to have the answer. But by consulting with film experts, eyewitnesses, pathologists, and some of Hollywood's top movie makers, we've given you an opportunity to hear from all sides. Is this alien autopsy really fact or fiction? Until we know more, you'll have to decide. What if? 
What if? What if the alien is real? Let's consider. He was an explorer, perhaps a scientist. Crashed and died on a distant blue planet, light years from his home. A frightened race of beings found his lifeless body, performed experiments, and hid the results. Why did he come to our planet? What went wrong? Obviously, his own mission failed. But in his death, he may have delivered the most important message mankind has ever received. We are not alone. I'm Jonathan Frakes. Good night. This is Robert Kiviet, executive producer of Alien Autopsy, Fact or Fiction. Due to the overwhelming interest in this program when it aired on network television, coming up next and exclusively for this home video, you will see for the first time ever the entire uncut alien autopsy footage. In addition, you will see the complete footage allegedly showing the debris from the purported flying saucer that crashed in Roswell in 1947.
Thank you.